And it's the launch of the Janet, Wendy and John Lass seminar series. It promises to be collaborative, creative and solution driven. This seminar is going to be recorded and it has a, you'll have access to it at this CEF website. I'm Judy McDonald and I'm the Associate Director with the McLaughlin Centre of Population Health and Risk Assessment. And I'm an adjunct professor with the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, better known as CEF. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll be hosting today's seminar. Uh, Janet Collins is the Business Manager for CEF and the Technical Magician for this seminar. To now uh, give a special welcome to the last family is Professor and Director of the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, Dr. Melissa Browers. Dr. Browers, welcome. Thank you very much, Judy. And I'm really pleased that we are able to um, have the last family join us for our inaugural uh, series. As many of you know, we had hoped uh, to be having an in-person event a few years ago that got scuttled by COVID. Um, and it's great that we can at least start our virtual series um, under John and Wendy's name due to the very generous gift from the family and support of the family that they have shown the school. Uh, thank you, Judy. Thanks to the organizing committee. Thank you, Ron, for being part of this. But uh, thank you, Last Family, for your continued support and interest. Um, it means a great deal to us. And I am sure at some point we will see each other in person. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the uh, session. I'm looking forward to it myself. Dr. Barros, thank you. So we have two uh, acknowledgements. First, uh, it's to pay uh, respect to the Algonquin people. Uh, there, uh, we have traditional, gar the traditional gardenings of this land and we acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call this home in Ottawa. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present and dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with First Nations, Inuit, Métis communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We also like to acknowledge the contributors to this seminar, John and Wendy Last, University of Ottawa Faculty of Medicine and the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, the Organizing Committee, uh, Bloomsbury uh, Publishing, and Dr. Ronald Labonte. The perfect choice to provide a brief last family history is Dr. Ian McDowell. He is an emeritus professor with Seth and was a longtime colleague and friend of Dr. John Last. As his beloved wife, Wendy, was in declining health due to ALS, John hatched the idea of setting up a John and Wendy Last Memorial Fund. Characteristically, he did not dictate how the fund should be used because he recognized that times and priorities change. It is also characteristic that he put both of their names on the fund, for Wendy was his muse, his traveling companion, and was at the very center of his worldwide span of friends and colleagues. He knew that without her support, he would never have achieved what he did. John Last liked to claim that the Lord put him on this earth to be an editor, and at this he excelled. Not only did he edit the Canadian Journal of Public Health for many years, but also three editions of the massive Maxi Rosenau Public Health textbook, which then was renamed Maxi Rosenau Last. His dictionaries of epidemiology and later of public health are internationally renowned. In the political arena, he was a vocal advocate for ethical standards in public health practice and research. John worked at lightning speed. He maintained personal friendships with leading figures in epidemiology across the world. He had the ability to encourage badger or cajole people into producing manuscript on time and then to survive his instant and detailed editing of their text. He loved language and dismissed unclear thought and needless words. At one time or another, we all experienced the sharp end of his editorial pen, 
but it was always employed in the interests of improving our work. Well into his retirement, John diversified his editorial attention to support Wendy's creativity. He was proud of her paintings, which hung on their apartment walls, and assembled these into a privately published volume of her art and poems. In his late 80s, he drew on memories of the Adelaide of his youth to write an adventure story for children. This featured a wise talking parrot that guided a group of children to hidden treasure and then saved them from a band of splendidly evil adults hell-bent on seizing the treasure. John could be relied on to deliver an opinion in any situation. After Wendy died, we often met for beer and some lunch. My role was chiefly to get him to expound on politics, on the latest Anna Maria Tremonti broadcast, on his own podcasts, or the various novels he had read the previous week. But his favorite topic remained to update me on his children and grandchildren, of whom he was immensely proud. Unsentimental, John was always ready with a disparaging yet witty comment, dismissing a colleague's contribution. Ah, he's about as welcome as a gonococcus with bad breath. The license plate on the small car he purchased in his late 70s was last one, and he seemed entirely adjusted to his own mortality, which came towards the end of 2019 at the age of 92. We hope that this series of presentations will combine the amazing diversity of John's academic interests with Wendy's sensitivity and deep caring for humanity. Jennifer and Dr. McDowell, thank you. Dr. Ronald Labonte has an international reputation that extends from global health, medical tourism, political economics, tobacco control, food security, to health care reform. He is a distinguished uh, research chair in globalization and health equity, a professor with the University of Ottawa and Flinders University in Australia, and, and active with the People's Health Movement and United Nations uh, agencies. Dr. Labonte has authored and co-edited over 12 books and is editor-in-chief of the Biomed Central Journal, Globalization and Health. He'll begin by giving us a peek at the award-winning book, Global Health Watch, sixth edition, followed by your questions, which Jennifer will monitor in the chat. Then we all have his permission to probe inside his mind as an internationally uh, established author and editor. Please virtually welcome Dr. Ronald Labonte. Okay, well, thank you very much, Judy. And um, uh, and I know that you're, you've already told me the very probing, interesting questions, which I will try to answer um, about what it's like to try to, to write. Uh, I was rather partial to the description of John Last being primarily an editor because the book I'm actually going to be focusing on is an edited collection. It's one that I contributed to, but it's, it's primarily the issues about the challenges of working uh, as an editor with, with contributors. I also have to share just a little personal story. I have here a little glass of water. Um, and on the glass, it's inscribed OPHA 1984. So that's the Ontario Public Health Association 1984 conference. And that's because I participated in a session that John Last organized. Uh, it was on environmental and health issues, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the session, uh, the conference organizers uh, gave John a little speaker's gift. And it was this little cup inscribed OPHA 1984, uh, but true to John, probably because by that time his fame had already eclipsed any other possibilities and the number of speakers gifts was way too large for his bookcase. Um, he very kind of graciously gifted me this glass and I still have it to this day. Um, now I'm going to share my screen very briefly and uh, uh, just have a few slides related to the book here. So I'm assuming you can all see this. So Global Health Watch 6, um, the, uh, uh, essentially here, uh, the book that I'm going to be sort of speaking to 
um, which uh, just hang on here a moment. This always happens. I'm out of practice. I haven't taught uh, now for uh, uh, since last fall. So my, my acumen with Zoom is not quite as good as it once was. So anyway, speaking about this, um, uh, now this book is the, uh, really is the latest in a, um, uh, in a project that's really been driven by grassroots activists, by academic activists, and they were all bound by the belief in the ethical and human rights-based importance to health equity, and that's within and between countries. And it initially grew out of something called a People's Health Assembly that was first held in Savar, Bangladesh in 2002. And uh, a key campaign of this assembly was to support the former uh, WHO Director General, uh, Helft and Mahler's call for health for all by the year 2000. Now it's aspirational and of course we, we know we haven't achieved that, but it arose from the original 1976 Alma-Ata Declaration on Primary Healthcare. Now it's important to note that this declaration referenced the determinants of health, discussed the political importance of new international economic order in which the colonizing rich countries of the global north needed to provide reparations for the theft of natural resources um, uh, uh, and the riches of the global south. Now, unfortunately, uh, conservative politics and neoliberalism arose in the 1980s and very quickly globalized. And so logically, a concern with neoliberalism and global political economy has been uh, rather central uh, to the lead chapters in each edition of Global Health Watch 6. So turning to uh, uh, kind of like what the structure of the book is to give you a sense of what the structure is like, um, uh, what we have is, uh, Uh, each, each edition of the Global Health Watch has been largely unchanged uh, since its very first edition in 2005. And so we, it was divided into five parts. The first was a look at the global political and economic structure. The second was around health systems. The third was beyond healthcare. The fourth was around watching. And we used to have a section on resistance and change to sort of be a bit optimistic towards the end. The difference with Global Health Watch 6 is that instead of a separate collection of examples of good politics and good economics and good community mobilization and advocacy, we insisted as editors that these would become central elements in each of the chapters. Uh, so you could have no criticism without some discussion of alternatives and some indication of efforts to bring them about. I was asked by Judy to speak a little bit about some of the challenges in producing this book. And so in rough chronological order, the first is organizing content. We had a two day meeting in Geneva with about 35 people representing all the different civil society organizations participating uh, with all of the usual activist disagreements about what should be in the chapters. And then it was actually getting activists at the meeting to sign up to help in writing them. Uh, we had a week-long meeting in Bologna with my co-editor, uh, Chiara Bodini, uh, where we identify contributors and develop specific outline requirements for each chapter. And that would include the four that I would actually write or be the lead co-author on. Uh, and that was simply a lot of grinding work, but it was incredibly useful in starting the solicitation of the chapters. We had a clear production schedule. We felt really good about our early progress until January 2020, COVID, and everything was put on hold for the next 12 to 18 months. Our chapter briefs had to be rewritten, and while we didn't want that book to be just COVID-centered, it was important to note how the pandemic was affecting all of the material we had outlined for the content, hence this kind of subtitle about being in the shadow of the pandemic. So given this, it was a rather slow getting our first drafts in. And since many contributors did not have English as their first language and others uh, uh, were clearly more grassroots than academic activists, uh, Chiara and I spent a lot of time editing, revising, rewriting, going through an average of at least three drafts of each chapter. And of course, sometimes joking that it would have been faster had we simply written the entire book ourselves. Um, I sometimes wonder if John Last had the same impression with some of the things that he was editing. <laughs> Now we finally got it to the publisher last September, uh, then internal and external reviews, then copy editing two rounds and galley proofing three rounds. And in the end, over 120 people were involved in producing the book. 
Many of the chapters had multiple contributors writing case studies or different sections. And of course, keeping track of all of this was a major task Kara and I had as editors. Now, the book had been slated for initial release in late January, hence I wanted to talk about it in this particular lecture. Um, uh, but the publisher moved that to early March, and then perhaps owing to supply chain difficulties, it has been deferred until mid-May. Uh, that's a bit of a disappointment, but uh, at least the, the ebook, which is a bargain at $28, you can be downloadable from the publisher's site by mid-April. Uh, Judy also wanted me to just talk a little bit about the content of the book itself. So as you can sort of see what, what the breakdown of the different uh, uh, chapters are here, uh, the structure of the book, um, what, it, what the kind of um, uh, more than any previous of the watch's 15 years uh, of assessing the state of the world's health, we used to call ourselves the, the alternative world health report. Uh, the pandemic revealed the depth of global inequities in access to resources essential for health and that this equalizing risk is posed for our future survival. So the first chapter kind of views the global and economic dislocations of the pandemic as a continuation of three existential pre-pandemic trends, the, the widening economic inequities, the worsening ecological impacts, and the growing movements of people seeking relief from poverty, conflict, climate change are all three. The second takes a deep dive into the gender dynamics of these trends before, during, and likely after the pandemic. And for those who are need a touch of optimism, the third chapter actually begins with a discussion of a post-COVID economy for health and sustainability. Now, the next section B focuses on health systems. It begins with a critique of the ongoing privatization and also of the strengthening pushback against that in many parts of the world. It also began to explore some of the critical issues for the first time, at least as far as global health watchers are concerned, in the health equity benefits and risks of the rise of digital health. And the big concern here, of course, is the monopoly power of the corporations that run the digital technologies and platforms. But it would also be impossible in the context of the pandemic not to discuss the role of intellectual property rights on the inequities in global access to vaccines and now, kind of expanding to access to therapeutics, uh, driven by what some have called excess profiteering by big pharma. And that's a long-standing issue of global health activists. But one of the pandemic's enduring shadows remains its impact on mental ill health. And one of our chapters explores this from the vantage of community organizations that are being developed to offer collective assistance for many of the most affected. Now, our Beyond Healthcare Section C runs through many of the systemic challenges facing countries worldwide. So that's the return of austerity measures, and that's supposedly to rein in excess debt or reduce the risk of inflation, but it's really more to shore up a, a rather neoliberal status quo, disrupted labor markets, uh, continuing promotion of unhealthy commodities, but noting that there's been a lot of successful activist interventions to clip the capital accumulating wings of transnational companies involved, uh, efforts to prevent the environmental destruction of global ex extractivism, uh, or to promote agro, agro that's always a tough one, agroecological alternatives to the industrial model. And that model in large measure is a source of most of the zoonotic infections, including SARS-CoV-2. Now the final watch section D, a prominent feature of all the previous editions, looks at the different institutions or rules of global governance that shape our possible futures. Uh, the World Health Organization remains key to global health watch analyses, as have contributions on trade and investment treaties. And in this issue, the focus is really on how they have impacted some of the inequitable health outcomes of the pandemic. And critical attention is also given to the increasing role of the private sector, primarily transnational capital and corporations and then private philanthropy in these uh, global institutions, in the rule making and in global health governance. Uh, now, all of this might sound a bit gloomy, but as I mentioned earlier, we ensure that in each chapter where there is a critique of the way things are, there are also stories of mobilization and progressive health change. So these examples are, are brought together nicely in the book's conclusion. So I would encourage you that, that uh, if interested um, uh, at all, I, 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 I would encourage you to consider uh, uh, doing a pre-order of the book. Um, and 
if you want all of the earlier editions of Global Health Watch are freely downloadable right now. Just Google Global Health Watch and it'll come up, uh, including the almost still new 2017 edition. Back to you, Judy. Thank you. So Jen, uh, have we got anybody from the audience with questions? Not yet. Oh, I can start. Um, so I, I, uh, I wanted to start looking at some of the details around uh, um, that change that happened when you, when you started looking at COVID, how you decided to, uh, what, what part of COVID worked the best in your book? Uh, it's there's there's there is hardly a chapter in fact there isn't a chapter that hasn't discussed covid in in some way where it comes up most uh, logically enough um is really in the uh, chapter on gender uh, uh and then again in the chapter looking at health systems um uh the chapter dealing with intellectual property rights uh, and what's that meant in terms of vaccine equity um, so it comes up really a lot around the the actual public health health systems uh, elements of the book, uh, less so in terms of looking at some of the the economic uh, uh, underpinnings, and that's important because we did not, as I said at the beginning, when we were having to revise the book's content to take account of the pandemic, we did not want it to simply be a COVID only book. We wanted it to sort of uh, really interrogate all the other kind of aspects or dimensions that both led to the pandemic in the first place, uh, but then also kind of meant what are the kinds of policies that we need to put in place post pandemic to ensure uh, a greater health equity and, and some sort of ecological sustainability. And what was your uh, publisher's reaction? How do you work with them through a, you know, a major change in the book like that? Uh, well, that's that's actually well, that wasn't too difficult. Um, we they, they themselves were facing all kinds of problems as a book publisher. Everything was being pushed back, so we just we just uh, uh, chatted with them and sort of said that um, okay, we think that we're going to be about a year late because we really need to bring this pandemic into into uh, account as the chapters are being written. Um, and they said fine, uh, and uh, they they've been very very helpful in that respect. The one place that was this disappointment is the fact that that we we kept uh, seeing a deferral in terms of when we would actually get the the published version out, uh, and that's partly because this book was was put together by so many different kind of activists in some form or another, and they really wanted to use the content of this in their organizing work in in the various countries in which they're located in in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, Europe, North America. They have to wait. Um, uh, we're sharing some some material, but we can't share it all because we don't want to violate our contract with the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jen, I know that um, David Last actually has a, a question that he'd like to ask last, but uh, is there anyone else that has a question? Uh, yes, we have one from Rebecca Last. Um, she's curious about the intersection between health politics, misinformation, and mental health that we seem to be seeing. Witness, for example, the so-called anti-vax protests currently paralyzing Ottawa and other cities. Um, well, I mean, one could possibly sort of suggest that we need to have a mental health evaluation of, of certain kind of actions that are underway at the present time. Uh, but uh, I think that that uh, we didn't really deal too much in the book with the with the anti-vax issue. At the time when we were completing the manuscript, it hadn't uh, really assumed the same proportion that, that uh, in terms of dominating the discourse around, around COVID or around public health uh, as it has in the last six to eight months. So to try to answer your question a little bit is that the chapter on, on mental health is really, and it's actually based out of case studies out of India where they were putting in place various community actions or organizations to deal with, with a broader set of mental health issues, not simply what those that are related to the pandemic. And I think uh, David last has a question as well. Hello, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ronald and Judy and uh, Melissa for organizing this. If there's a motto here, it might be 
writing to change the world. And I'm really impressed by the way in which you've brought together a coalition of activists to produce this book. I'll be looking forward to having a look at the book contents itself. Obviously, public health isn't the only area where activists need to be mobilized, galvanized, brought together under a, 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 common, um, a, a common banner. I wonder if you've got advice for mobilizing activists in different fields. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of my, uh, my own field, uh, military education and uh, common security. And uh, I wonder if there is a, uh, a lesson in the way that you've approached the challenges of Global Health Watch uh, for other fields. Uh, I, I think it's uh, what usually has happened now is that the, because this is a, a, a kind of a largely um, uh, an undertaking of uh, this kind of large network called People's Health Movement um, and the People's Health Movement uh, uh, kind of loosely structured, but it has something called um, uh, circles and networks that exist in almost every country and across a range of different issues. And the people involved in those basically meet on a fairly regular basis, and they begin to look at uh, where there are actions at more local levels that they could that they could get engaged in. So uh, one of the really compelling chapters uh, in in the new book describes how this extractivism circle of, of people's health movement. So it's concerned with mining, it's concerned with all of the environmental aspects that occur, uh, the economic aspects that occur, the gendered aspects that occur, uh, the indigenous rights issues that arise. Um, what it does is it, it, is it looks at a whole series of different kind of activist um, mobilizations that have occurred at more local levels, more country specific levels. And then People's Health Movement and Global Health Watch tries to bring that together and then elevates that into understanding it from a global perspective. So there's a number of different kind of global initiatives that People's Health Movement has. I don't think there's any particular real recipe for how to mobilize, except people need to feel a bit passionate about the issue. Uh, they need to, uh, dare I put it this way, there need to be some policy targets, there need to be some reform places and some options that they can be begin to promote. Uh, and then they, they essentially engage in what, 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 what uh, civil society activists have always engaged in, 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 in various forms of, of uh, you could call protest, um, activism, uh, social mobilization. Uh, we saw a lot of that happening here in Canada around, for example, the vaccine apartheid or the vaccine nationalism that Canada uh, regrettably sort of engaged in from the early, day, uh, early stages of the pandemic. And uh, I think... Uh... Dr. Kruski has a question. So uh, really nice to see, Ron, a sixth edition of such an important book. That is uh, really uh, an accomplishment on your part. I'm interested in trying to make a linkage between the theses uh, in your book and a project that we're just about to launch, which is a global risk census. It's mm -hmm. a, a very uh, detailed census of what are the conditions of risk that might actually result in major risk disasters of a health, environmental, technological, economic nature in the future. So we're planning to canvas people all over the world. We already have uh, the, the, uh, the, the website uh, ready to roll. It's very, very glitzy, very professional, but trying to anticipate and prevent future uh, uh, risk disasters, anticipate and prevent maybe the next pandemic, uh, deal with global change, uh, economic downturns, uh, you know, all, all sorts of maybe uh, risk issues related to, to conflict. Do you see any anything that you could advise me from your book that would help me do a better job of my goal of preventing future risks at the global scale? Uh, basically, Dan, what I would sort of say, and this is something the, the approach taken in, in, in the Global Health Watch, uh, uh, the current edition, past editions, um, is that uh, uh, it's once you've identified where the potential problems are, 
it becomes important, at least this is what we do uh, through, through PHM, People's Health Movement and the Global Health Watch, is to keep asking, um, uh, but why, but why, but why? And to sort of try to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into what some of the social systemic drivers are that create those risk situations. So it's, it's going beyond identification into some sort of argumentative analysis, some sort of a, 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 an empirically informed, but argumentative analysis of what are the key drivers. And then from the key drivers, um, uh, then making again a case for certain kind of policy interventions that are not just specific to a single risk, but more generic in terms of across the totality of risks. So I would try to look at risk, you know, kind of all these risk assessment things by sort of saying, what lies beneath and what, what, what connects them together in some way that, that provides us with an understanding of, of, of where we really want to direct some of our more kind of, I guess, activist and policy change um, initiatives. Ron, I would love a chance to sit down and chat with you about um, what we were just discussing, the, the learnings from your book and this global risk census that we're just launching, because one of the things we've built into it is the ability to receive targeted questionnaires from other groups, and we can just actually roll that out as a specialized questionnaire as part of the larger global risk census. So if you have some questions you want to ask the world uh, related to Global Health Watch, Let's talk and we'll see if we could construct a, a short targeted questionnaire uh, together. Okay, uh, that's, that, 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 that sounds more like a follow-up invitation. So invitation accepted, we'll just have to work out the details. That, that was my only point, Melissa, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I have two questions, but I can do one and then wait in case there's other people. So the one question I had is, um, do you have any plans either yourself or with your co-authors or even with your publishers around other types of deliverables that you might make around the key messages that are emerging from the book. So for example, uh, short videos or doing some research work afterwards to see how the messages and advice and the perspectives from the book are being used to inform uh, policy or decisions internationally. Has that been part of uh, the dialogue at all? Uh, yes, it has been. Uh, there have been webinars uh, uh, that PHM, People's Health Movement, has produced um, on the topics that are in the book uh, as well. A lot of the topics in the book uh, became part of the agenda for the Prince Maidal Awards Conference, which is an annual event uh, coming out of Thailand um, uh, uh, every January, uh, kind of January, February. And uh, uh, out of that, we also did, we, we did three webcasts um, based on some of the topics that are in the book. Uh, there will be more that are produced and a lot of the contributors, the individual kind of our groups involved in the, in the individual chapters are keen to produce more forms of outreach uh, uh, that would include even kind of workshops, uh, symposia, uh, try to keep momentum going. So the book, the book, has always been like Global Health Watch, right from the beginning was always considered to be um, uh, something that would be uh, uh, sort of a, a, an initiator, uh, not, it, it's to incentivize new actions, not simply to document the problems and then, you know, but, but really to be used as, a, as an organizing mobilizing tool. That's awesome. Um, Judy, can I ask another question? Yeah, please. Excellent. So this is more about sort of the content and, and how you've structured it and the narrative arc. Uh, another question I have is in reflecting on the content and um, the, the research that your uh, uh, authors have done and their perspectives, are you surprised at what's happening in Ottawa with this convoy? Should there be any empathy around the position they're bringing? I, I'm just wondering if this should have been expected. Um, uh, should have been expected. Um, a, a sort of a, a kind of a qualified yes and no. Um, uh, am, 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 I, I'm, I'm rather shocked at what is happening, but, but um, I think that, that no one knew the, uh, at the beginning or early stages of the convoy um, uh, the extent to which uh, we could sort of say is that there are 
uh, rather far right kind of uh, groups that are involved in in staging the the, the convoy, and I'm 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 kind of concerned that in fact, uh, and this is something that's come up with some of our contributors in terms of of uh, the the extent to which this is challenging what we would consider to be kind of liberal democratic norms, and and that to me is that that would have been something that I would have been very concerned with. Um, and I think uh, a lot of our authors would have pointed in the direction in terms of like what's happened uh, in, in the past in Latin America and some of the African countries, Asian countries, but kind of what did it happen? The fact that it's happening in Canada, uh, I think caught all of us by surprise. You know, it's wonderful to have this kind of uh, back and forth thing. Thanks, Melissa. Just to have the back and forth is really what we're going after with this seminar. And I think, Jennifer, there's a few more questions uh, that have come up. So thanks, everybody, for being involved. But Jen, is there some other uh, questions? Yes. So the next one's from Bonnie, uh, and it's about the uh, writing process. Can you speak about the hurdles and strategies to keep motivated and focused, especially as the nature of the work uh, shifts with changing external contexts? And even just uh, generally keeping motivated and focused. Ah, okay. How to keep these are sort of the questions I think that actually Judy wanted to write uh, or sort sort of posed to me in terms of what the writing process actually actually looks like. Um, uh, well, how do I keep how do I keep motivated? How do I is this like how do I keep going with projects that face different sort of challenges, uh, all the unexpected? And, and um, uh, uh, if that's the case, I, I, I sort of already covered some of the specific challenges that arose in, in Global Health Watch 6. Um, and and uh, for other books in terms of some of the difficulties of keeping going, uh, a lot of the unexpected that happens in writing is, is usually headed off in some negotiation with the publishers before the writing starts. Uh, that's perhaps less so when I am contributing chapters to books edited by others where I'm sometimes surprised by reviewers' comments, especially so with journal articles. And I speak now not just as someone uh, who has managed uh, uh, to publish books, but also uh, almost 400 articles in peer-reviewed journals. But in terms of this kind of maintaining some momentum, um, and when, when I feel that things are, are falling apart, it's, it's to sort of uh, sit for a day or two before reacting to, to what it, whatever it is that got in the way, be it a bad review uh, uh, or a review you didn't like, uh, be it a comment from a publisher, um, uh, be it uh, uh, having to massage maybe some of your contributors who are a little upset when you've sent back their chapter for their third or fourth time, suggesting revisions here, there, and everywhere else. Um, uh, but but I always I always find it uh, uh, kind of useful, kind of continuing to review, parse through, revise, rewrite, um, and uh, when all else fails, I go out for a walk. You know, it's great to hear those personal strategies because it uh, it is what makes you get back on and uh, and and really produce. What you're supposed to and a question i uh was curious about is what is a typical rookie mistake that the authors make oh a typical a typical a mistake that rookie authors i think it's it's the paralysis when confronting um uh the blank monitor screen so that uh, just being overwhelmed by having an emptiness that you have to fill in some way um uh that's you know just time and 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 putting even crappy stuff down into the blank space is one of the ways of beginning to overcome that. Um, another, I think, and, and it was one that I certainly suffered from quite a lot in the early stages, was wanting to be perfect the first time out. So I did that for a while, and then kind of it sort of slowly dawned on me that I would learn more by not being quite so perfect. So in other words, uh, uh, I needed to try to get something out initially. And then, and usually when I write, I, I, I go through four, five, six, eight, ten 10 revisions of anything I've written before I actually sort of send it to a publisher or send it to a journal. Um, now, maybe, maybe around book four or five or article 150 or 160, I thought it was okay once more uh, to want to be a bit more perfect as I'm writing. 
um, or at least to try to, uh, although still uh, there are some reviewers who don't always agree with me that I've actually crossed that particular threshold. But the, the biggest thing is uh, uh, trying too hard to be, to be perfect. Jennifer, do we have other questions from uh, the audience? Yes, we've got one from Melissa. I don't know if Melissa would prefer to say that verbally. I can also read it. Sure, no, I, I, I can say. So just about the writing, Ron, um, you're unique, I think, in the school because I think a lot of the faculty in SEF, and I would say our students in general, are really more apt to be journal article writers rather than book writers. Mm -hmm. And um, with the exception, say, of Dr. Last and a few others. But do you think this is a gap in our interdisciplinary school? And do you <sighs> think there should be more of us who, who try to get into that space um, with, with the type of scholarship we promoted, the type of areas we study? Yes, but I have a bias. Okay, uh, and 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 one of these, the uh, the reason for my bias is that that uh, my my initial university degrees were in English and creative writing, so I find writing to be something uh, pretty easy, pretty straightforward, difficult at times, but it's something I am absolutely drawn to just because of the act of writing, not necessarily with the research, but the act of writing, um, uh, and it was just by accident, more or less, that I found myself working in public health since about 1972. So I, I, I kind of always considered myself as a social justice activist first, a writer second, a public health worker third, and then for the past 25 years, a public health academic kind of in last place. Um, uh, and, and so I think, yes, there's something to be said about, about working on a, a, a writing as an art, writing as a craft. So it, it does come fairly easy to me, but, but uh, again, another reason is that prior to moving more into academia, I'd written uh, over 150 journalistic articles, uh, commentaries, some editorials, so things that, 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 that were more about creating narrative arcs in a particular, uh, in a particular way. Um, I, I'd almost be, go so far as, as to actually sort of say that, that I would, I, I think that instead of, or in addition, to having the, the, the journal clubs in SEF. Maybe you should have book clubs and where people read novels. Um, uh, uh, I may be unusual in that respect, but I cannot go without reading something from a novel every single day. And, and that's because of how different ways of approaching language create different responses. So now it is true that research articles follow a fairly conventional formula based on a journal's formatting requirements uh, and the kind we so love to comply with in our recent world of online open access journal submissions. But I think the challenge there is for writing is really to create a narrative. So a storyline that hooks the reader beyond just reporting the results and something that strives to report on something of substantive and not just of statistical importance. So, so when I used to teach some of the uh, uh, graduate programs back at the University of Toronto in the 1990s, one of the challenges I faced um, uh, uh, was, was basically uh, getting people to think about um, writing as storytelling and, and, and not simply as kind of, kind of almost anonymous reportage but as storytelling, you, because if you want to reach an audience, there, there are some audiences that will respond really well to all of the statistical charts tables, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And others who will respond better um, uh, by, they want to go and look and sort of say, well, what are the questions you're posing first? So that's, that's, that's who sets the agenda of the story? And then they'll go, and they'll go to the conclusions because that's basically, well, what does the story actually tell us? And it's sort of sandwiching in the middle are all the actual research results. So I think getting better at telling stories is something that, that could really work. Thank you. Awesome. I love those ideas, Ron, around a book club. I think that would be very cool. We had a question earlier, um, and it brings us back to your book. It was um, from Desiree Kramer, and she was asking about uh, in her research, mental health is emerging as a you know, bigger issue than physical health and the pandemic 
um, has led to this isolation and fear. Uh, it you know it poisons even authors. Uh, is there a difference from other uh, diseases, and uh, what's the effect that the pandemics had in other countries uh, in terms of productivity, I guess, and uh, uh, work academically? Well, we know uh, this is something that that wasn't central uh, per se to, to Global Health Watch Six. It, it came up in relation to uh, uh, our engagement with the with some of the contributors, who, of course, um, uh, a lot of the women were facing uh, challenges in terms of, of of lockdowns, in terms of uh, multiple caretaking tasks. Um, uh, uh, that's that's pretty much well known. Um, uh, we also kind of uh, in, in encountered a, a lot of discussion around, uh, uh, and we would try to, you know, especially amongst the, with Kara and I, we, we would try to ensure that we were uh, uh, paying attention to some of the, uh, I would call it mental health, but at least some of the emotive responses people were having um, uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and cutting people a lot of slack, as it were, in terms of, of the time frames with which they were working. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I agree completely with the comment that, that, that mental health um, outside, I mean, it's, it's almost like I, I, I started off by saying the book's got the three great existential crises, which were about in, inequalities, uh, uh, climate catastrophe, um, and then uh, a huge movement of people trying to escape. Uh, uh, the various uh, inequities of their of their living conditions, but but the mental health sort of cuts across all of that in terms of, of the mental ill health, the the kind of the way in which we feel. The so yeah, um, uh, I have a feeling that that's going to continue uh, to loom larger and larger in the immediate uh, uh, context of our public health concerns. Do you have any final comments in terms of just your private strategies as an author? Uh... Anything that uh, would be helpful for our writers, uh, novel readers? Uh, well, sure. I mean, one of them is that yeah, that kind of uh, the act of writing. Um, and I know that 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 Judy, you sort of sent me a note, sort of thing you were interested in knowing about how do I actually prepare to sit down and and, and write, and and do I have any particular rituals? Well, apart from waking up early in the morning and making the first cup of coffee and sitting down and checking my email, probably not. Uh, but a, a lot of writers do have rituals or routines. And, and really for me, kind of uh, when I am able to, to start writing is when I have some cognitive clarity on how I want to tell the story. I hate to keep going back to the fact about narrative arcs and storytelling, but I think good writing is, is storytelling, whether it's research or otherwise. Uh, so when I have that clarity, um, then I also, I start to tune out almost everything else. Um, I shut down email. Um, I don't listen to music. Some people like to write to listen to, I don't listen to music. Um, and essentially, I, I just focus with really complete intent. So, so I'm also not one of these people who can write in fits and starts. Um, uh, maybe once the bulk of an article or a chapter is done and I can very clearly see the finish line or where my narrative arc is taking me to uh, and have a feeling of passing this pinnacle with a well-oiled slope to slide home on, then I can take small steps with less intensity. Now, I know that there are other people who write who set aside a certain period each day, often in the mornings, maybe sometimes in the evenings. And I don't think there's any rules except the persistence in giving oneself enough time and lack of clutter to focus well. Now, some people also pretty much scribble their initial drafts almost as a stream of consciousness, um, sort of blurting out everything, knowing uh, or hoping that they can finally shape it into a logical, intelligible whole sometime later. Uh, I think all writers probably do that to some extent, but, but for me, and this is really kind of the, the, the legacy or the curse of my undergraduate years in English and creative writing and then my subsequent journalism kind of, of uh, work, I'm infatuated with language. So word choices, sentence structures, paragraph breaks, the, the, the nitty gritty of how language communicates in a written form is actually where I find uh, uh, as much meaning as in what it is I might be reporting on or writing about, but also the most pleasure in the act of writing. So I would, I would encourage people, uh, you know, you just have to sit down, you do it, give yourself time and space, be incredibly generous to yourself if, if things don't go well, really, really well the first time. Um, uh, and, and, and 
try to enjoy just what language is. Because language and, and writing, uh, they're just, they're beautiful things. And that's why I encourage people to read novels um, and occasionally to even, uh, you know, dabble in poetry. Uh, you just really experience the aesthetics of what it is you are writing and not simply the, the, the kind of more scientific content. Scientific content, absolutely important. But let's, let's give a little, more uh, a little more time to the aesthetics. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you as, as the one to launch this uh, Janet and Wendy John last seminar series uh, and having our audience, The Last Family. So thank you for sharing your, um, your new book and your personal insights to uh, what drives your success. Uh, to wrap up this session, Dr. Christopher Gravel will uh, tell us what's next. And Dr. Gravel is uh, an assistant professor in biostatistics in CEF. And he's co-chair the uh, Janet, Wendy, and John Last seminar series with Tara Elton uh, Marshall. So uh, Dr. Gravel, welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, Judy. Um, first, I just wanted to thank Dr. Ramavanti again for his insightful talk. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear about your upcoming work, uh, Global Health Watch 6. But also as an early career researcher, learning about your process and approach to undertaking such a challenge really resonated particularly the need to adapt to the emergence of the COVID pandemic midstream. Um, I can't even imagine how chaotic that must have been. I, I think many of us in attendance today can appreciate the guidance offered in your remarks. Uh, so on behalf of the Janet, Wendy, and John Last Seminar Series Committee, I want to thank you for giving such a great talk. Um, thank you, Chris. Next, I want to thank Dr. Judy McDonald for facilitating the session and Jennifer Collins, who ran the technical aspects of today. And finally, a special thanks to the last family and to Dr. Ian McDonald for providing such thoughtful remarks about Wendy and John Last. I uh, did not have the pleasure of meeting them, so it was great to learn a bit about them from someone who knew them so well. Um, finally, on an administrative note, the recording of the event will be hosted on our website, the SEF website, and our plans are to schedule another seminar in the spring, so please keep an eye out for an email from our committee. And with that, thanks for coming and uh, have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone.